The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, this morning's gospel passage from Mark had me thinking this week about Easter eggs. Though not actually the Easter eggs that probably just came to mind for you. Not the ones that the kids will be hunting later today. No, I'm talking about Easter eggs in movies. Are you familiar with this trend? These types of Easter eggs are hidden references inside jokes or clues to the plot's development that are subtly incorporated into the on-screen action of a movie. For example, Pixar is really big on these Easter eggs. For example, in Toy Story 1, there's a scene where the toys are captured and held captive by the kid next door named Sid. And the carpet in Sid's room has the same design as the hallway from another inescapable place, the hotel from the 1980 horror classic, The Shining. <laughs> or take the movie Fight Club. It's a film that at its core is about consumerism, capitalism, and corporate culture. And so to emphasize that point, the director made sure that there was a Starbucks cup somewhere in every single scene of that movie. Now around my house, we've watched a lot of Frozen 2. <laughs> a lot. In fact, we've watched it all the way through the special features more than once, where many of the movie's Easter eggs are revealed, such as in a scene where Anna and Elsa are depicted as toddlers playing enchanted forests with snow figures, all the figures, if you look closely, are characters from other Disney movies. Or in another scene, there are two wooden figures in the background of the scene, which apparently resembles two of the designers who worked on the movie, probably only spotted by their dearest loved ones. Apparently, there's two, these are two of at least 13 Easter eggs in Frozen 2, but I will spare you the other 11. Or a final example is in the original Godfather movie. Keen movie watchers have noticed that oranges show up in many scenes. And this is a hint, because whenever you spot an orange, it means someone is about to die or someone's about to commit an act of betrayal or be betrayed. Makes you wonder if Judas was munching on an orange as he headed toward Gethsemane. I don't know if that's funny or not. Well, the reason I was thinking about these sorts of Easter eggs is because in St. Mark's telling of Jesus' resurrection, he includes such an Easter egg of his own in verse 5. 
When the three women arrive at the tomb to give Jesus a proper burial, but they find the stone rolled away, Mark says that they find inside the tomb a young man sitting on the right. Now Mark could have just said that this was an angel. That's how Matthew described this figure. And it's not that it wasn't an angel who actually greeted these women. But by choosing to refer to this figure as a young man, Mark is taking a literary liberty to make a particular point. Mark's use of the Greek word for not just man, but young man, neoniskos, is intended to have the reader recall a rather mysterious figure whom Mark also referred to as a young man, using that same Greek word, who was in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was betrayed days before and all his disciples abandoned him. I've reprinted this verse from Mark 14 on your yellow insert. We saw it last Sunday. We saw there in chapter 14, Mark wrote that a young man following Jesus was wearing nothing but a linen garment until they seized Jesus, and then this young man fled naked, leaving his garment behind. And last Sunday, I explained that this young man in chapter 14 was meant to represent what all the disciples had just done if not all of humankind's, uh, what all of humankind had just done. All of humankind's response to God coming near to us. See, the strange mention of his nakedness was meant to echo the consequence Adam and Eve experienced and the shame they felt after abandoning their relationship with God in Eden, another garden. And the Greek word for the linen cloth the young man left behind is the same word used to describe the cloth Jesus' dead body was buried in, signifying his complicity, the disciples' complicity, all of our complicity in Jesus' death. Since we have all sinned and rejected Jesus' lordship in various and sundry ways. But if the young man in chapter 14 is meant to represent the ways all of us have lived under the power of sin and the bad fruit it bears of fear, looking out only for ourselves and a lack of love, then the young man who greets the women in the tomb after Jesus' death and resurrection, chapter 16, that young man is meant to represent the very different way of being that's been open to all of us through Jesus' resurrection. As this young man in chapter 16 seems non-anxious, secure, and even partnering with the mission of the risen Jesus as a helpful and directing presence to these women who are at a different place in their journey with God. More on these women in just a bit. And so this juxtaposition of images Mark sets up between the way this young man was before Jesus' death and resurrection and the remarkable contrast with this other young man at the tombs, his disposition. This is meant to represent the transformation, the sort of real-life difference that the resurrection can make that it is meant to make in each one of our lives. You see, the good news of the resurrection is that through following the risen Jesus and learning and fellowshipping together with others who are doing the same, Jesus intends to take us from being like that fleeing, fearful, shame-filled figure who fled the garden to becoming like the trusting and loving figure who reflects Christ sitting at God's right hand in chapter 16. But the tension in this for all of us who are engaged in a spiritual relationship with the risen Lord is that we still struggle in many, many ways with being more like the figure in chapter 14 than the transformed figure in chapter 16. There are still many ways that the reality of Jesus' resurrection is meant to transform the way we live, but has yet to make an impact. 
Now you may wonder, well, what are we talking about here? So let me try to make it more concrete. Over the past year or two, drawing from the work of Gravity Commons, we've talked on occasion about ways that we can continue to live according to bad news, even if we're believers. Ways that we can fail to live in the good news that is true in the resurrection, which pertain to our three God-given needs that all of us have. These are the needs for belonging, for significance, and for security. The resurrection of Jesus was meant to open a way for us to trust God to care for these three primary needs outlined very briefly on that yellow insert. For example, when it comes to our sense of belonging, a a natural God-given human need that we all have, our faith in the risen Jesus is meant to address this need because through his resurrection... We have been adopted into the family of God and given a new identity as his children. The God of the universe knows each one of us intimately and desires for us to live in spiritual connection to him, receiving his affection and esteem for us. But too often, we don't live as if this good news is true at all. Instead, we believe the bad news or the lie that I am what others think I am. I am what others think. And so we set about to create a sense of belonging for ourselves apart from God by working to get people to like and appreciate and accept us. So how do we know if we're doing that, if we're living according to the bad news of I am what others think and seeking to meet our need for belonging apart from God? Well, gravity provides a list of just a few possible symptoms that I thought I'd share. This is not by any means exhausted, exhaustive. They say, for example, though, that if we're always trying to impress others with humor, intellect, niceness, fashion, talents, we might be failing to believe the good news of the belonging Jesus has won for us. Or if we often say yes to others' needs and demands, but end up resenting or regretting it, or do it to the neglect of more important relationships and responsibilities, we might be living according to some bad news about our belonging. Or let's say when someone responds to us in a negative way, they're short with us or dismissive or whatever, if we tend to internalize that as being our fault, we might be living in some bad news about our belonging. And a final example, when we say or don't say something for fear of what others may think, bad news about belonging may be at work. If If we're doing any of these things, some bad news about belonging might be at work in our lives, or it might not. There may be some other explanation. For me, I would say that two of those four I just listed, personally, are definitely struggles for me. Because of ways my heart can still fail to embrace the belonging that is mine in the family of God and the body of Christ. But the resurrection of Jesus is meant to free us from being enslaved to what others think. With the good news that God sees us, God knows us, God loves us just as we are. However, getting that good news from our heads to our hearts and actually living according to it, making decisions according to that truth, well, that's where we need Jesus' help. And so centering our lives upon following Jesus and learning and fellowshipping with others who are seeking to do the same, this is the program Jesus has provided for us to grow in our capacity to live out of a sense of belonging that's actually grounded in Him, in the risen Lord. 
So that's belonging. But the second God-given need where bad news can be running our lives pertains to our desire to have a life of significance. The good news of the resurrection pertaining to significance is that God has given us authority and responsibility to exercise power as his representatives in his kingdom. God has involved us in the family business, you might say. Partnering with him to love people at our work, in our home, in the communities we're part of. To love them in the way Christ loves them. But too often, we settle instead for creating our own sense of significance. Through achievement or through exercising control in our relationships. And we buy into the bad news or the lie that I am what I do. I am what I do. That's my identity. So just a few symptoms that we might be deriving our sense of self-worth in this dysfunctional way. Again, not exhaustive, but it can include if we have a need to be in control. Always running the meeting, always driving the car, always calling the shots then some bad news about our significance might be at work in our hearts. Or if we get frustrated when others don't take our brilliant advice, we might be failing to believe the good news of the significance God offers us to care for others in a non-controlling way like he does. If we've ever thought, I'm going to have to do this if I want it done right. That might be a symptom. Or if you find yourself rationalizing that collateral damage is just necessary and inevitable in certain situations, that it's just the way the world works, then some bad news about significant significance might be at work in you. Finally, if we've ever had grand visions of changing the world or if we have a drive to accomplish great things, some bad news about significance might be at work in our lives or it might not. There might be another explanation. I'd say two or three of those five definitely hit for me. But the resurrection of Jesus is meant to free us from the slavery of having to always create value for ourselves by trusting that our partnership with the Spirit of God to love others in our lives as Christ does, that that has more eternal significance than any value we could ever try to manufacture for ourselves. And centering our lives upon following Jesus and learning and fellowshipping with others who are seeking to do the same, this is the program Jesus has provided for us to live more out of the eternal significance of being his hands and feet in the world. Well, a third and final need listed for you there, where bad news can just be straight running our life pertains to our God-given need for security. Now the good news is if we put our trust in the risen Lord and become adopted into the family of God, the good news pertaining to security is that God looks out for his children. We can trust that. If we're his child, we can trust he is looking out for us. This means that we're always safe and secure in God's kingdom where the Lord seeks to impart to us his provision and peace. Though, of course, even if we die, or when we die, our trust in the one who overcame death means that even death cannot separate us from being secured and cared for by him. Well, this stuff's easier said than done, right? I mean, so often we instead settle for creating our own sense of security by grasping for wealth or hoarding material things or being overprotective of our time and being commitment averse. And we buy into the bad news or the lie that I am what I have. That's me. That's, That's what I am, my identity. I am what I have. 
what are some examples? Y'all probably give them to me on this one, right? But some examples of indications we're trusting in ourselves for security rather than God. When we can't seem to throw anything out just in case we need it, the bad news of security might be at work. It is hitting hard in here today. <laughs> now, I've grown some in this area a little bit, but I mean, have y'all seen my desk? Some of y'all have. Lord have mercy. I am a cereal pack rat. There's always a, but the day could come where I need that. Let's just keep moving along. So another sign we're trusting in ourselves for security might be if we only buy the cheapest versions of the goods and services we need. Now, I'm sure we have lots of rationalizations. If we feel sick to our stomachs when we need to use our savings account for something we really need, some bad news might be at work there related to security. Or if we can't imagine doing something or committing to something for the kingdom that we'd sort of like to do because we're afraid we might not have the energy for it. Some bad news about security might be at work in our hearts there. Or it might not. There might be another explanation. And I'm not saying that jokingly. Like, there legitimately might be. It's not black and white. Well, our relationship with God through the risen Jesus is meant to free us from the unbearable weight. And it is an unbearable weight an anxiety of having to secure ourselves against all possible risk in this world. It's meant to free us to make decisions with our resources from our time to our talents to our treasure in ways that honor the Lord and allow us to still sleep at night. And centering our lives upon following Jesus and learning and fellowshipping with others who are seeking to do the same. This is the program. That's the program that Jesus has provided for us to get to a place where we're resting more in the security that we are actually being looked out for by him. That it's not just us fitting for number one in this scary world. And so when we talk about ways that Jesus' resurrection is meant to begin transforming our dispositions and the ways that we engage our real daily lives, these are some of the concrete changes that we're talking about. And this journey of transformation is, a, is, is lifelong, right? We are all struggling in some of these ways. All of us. Everybody in this room. All of us have ways that we fail to live in the good news of our significance and belonging and security won for us in Jesus' resurrection. But what matters is whether we are on the path of following Jesus and practicing vulnerability and learning from other trusted believers, whether we're on that path or not. That's what makes the difference. Because that is what will determine whether we will be growing in any of these ways or not. In returning to our gospel passage for just a moment, this place of decision, this is precisely where the three women find themselves after their encounter with that young man in the tomb. The young man has told the women to go get the other disciples and meet Jesus in Galilee. So he's instructing these women and the others to go follow, go follow the risen Jesus together in community in order to learn in order to, to spend the rest of their lives learning how this empty tomb should actually change everything for them in these concrete ways in their lives. Not in just some, you know, flotty religious mumbo-jumbo ways. Real ways. The way we relate to people in our lives. That's what the resurrection is supposed to do. So that's what he's called them to do. But scholars believe that the original version of Mark's whole gospel ends right there at verse 8. Did you know that? I think I've talked about this once before. 
Mark's only 16 chapters long. It's the shortest of the Gospels. And if you were to open to any modern translation, translation of the Bible, you'd probably find a note that says the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 through 20 that follow this. And so verse 8 is likely where Mark's gospel originally ended. It's probable that some scribes were like, man, this is just too, too much of a cliffhanger. We've got to wrap this up a little bit better. And so they added verses 9 to 20. But ver- it's likely that, that verse 8 is where Mark's gospel originally ended. Verse 8 says, Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. So we don't know what they're going to do, right? It leaves us with a cliffhanger. But I'll tell you, trembling and afraid, they don't seem to be in a place a lot more... You know, they seem to be in a place more like that chapter 14 young man than the chapter 16 one that they just encountered, right? They seem to be like that chapter 14 man who was, who was caught up in a lot of bad news and was so overcome with fear in running away from Jesus. Their disposition seems a lot more like his at the moment than the confident, non-anxious presence of the young man they've just encountered in the tomb. And so Mark, the first of the four Gospels that was written, seems to have originally ended with the open question, will they, how will they respond to the resurrection news? Will they go find the other disciples and journey to Galilee or not? And I would suggest that in ending it that way, he poses the same question to us. Each of us is in that very same place today, both in the big picture of our lives as well as daily. We're in that place of decision. Will we allow for Jesus and the other believers he has appointed to help us, particularly, will we allow him to grow us into living more according to the good news of the resurrection? Or will we continue to settle for bad news running our lives just as much as it always has? I mean, is that really what we want to settle for? Because the way I let bad news run my life, it doesn't help anybody. In fact, it harms a lot of people. The good news of the resurrection is that through following the risen Jesus and learning and fellowshipping together with others who are doing the same, Jesus intends to take us from being like that fleeing, fearful, shame-filled figure in the garden of chapter 14 to becoming like the trusting and loving figure who is reflecting Christ in that very moment, reflecting Christ sitting at God's right hand. And so as we close, I wonder, how is the Lord inviting you to respond today? I know we've got a lot of different folks here today. We're glad you're here. Maybe the risen Jesus is inviting you to finally decide to center your life around following him. Instead of centering your life around trying to Garner security for yourself. Garner belonging for yourself. Garner significance for yourself. Or, maybe you think you've actually tried him. And thought, eh. But if that's the case, maybe instead of really trying to follow Jesus, you really just inherited from your family or church a Christianity that that really was kind of distorted from what Jesus is really like. If that's the case, I can empathize with that. I assure you. But would you be open to considering that maybe the Christianity you've tried could have been a pretty significant distortion of what Jesus is really like? 
Or if you're not really wanting to go there with Jesus just yet, maybe he's just inviting you to be more honest with wherever you are. Be more honest about it. Right? Whether that's getting honest with somebody else about the obstacles that you feel to trusting him, or maybe you go to church, but you're not really sure about all of this stuff, right? You do the motions and all that, but you're still sort of liking some of the ways that you have manufactured belonging and significance or security for yourself. Like it kind of is still working a little bit. The bottom hasn't fallen out quite yet. We'll never really grow in the Lord until we can begin getting honest with him about where we're at about him. Or maybe you've made Jesus your Lord, but, but you've been doing kind of the solo thing. Maybe it's relationships or vulnerability with other believers where you draw the line. Or, or maybe, for example, the Anglican church has a position on some issue you disagree with. Well, join the club. Me too. You wait around for the perfect church forever. The Lord didn't intend for us to follow him alone. We will rarely, if ever, become more like Jesus with the whole solo, I go to the mountaintops to see Jesus approach. He made us to be in relationships and the challenge that comes through that, the wrestling that comes through having to deal with, to be in relationship with other people who are sinners too. That's part of the, part of the design. And maybe pushing through your church hurt or baggage around vulnerability is precisely where God wants to provide you some healing and move you forward. Maybe a step toward that if you're a visitor is, is giving this community a chance. Or if you've been hanging out on the fringes, kind of, of giving some deeper commitment here a chance. Or some other church, I don't care. We need other people. If you've been on the fringes, maybe letting us begin to know you a little more. Perhaps you are engaged here, but you've still been hiding in this way or that. And, and Jesus is inviting you to risk coming into the light with other trusted believers, people you de- discern to be safe. Not everybody's safe. The good news of the resurrection is that through following the risen Jesus... And learning and fellowshipping together with others who are doing the same, Jesus intends to take us from being like that fleeing, fearful, shame filled figure in the Garden of Chapter 14 to becoming like the trusting and loving figure who reflects Christ's disposition as he sits at God's right hand. And so today we're celebrating and singing about Jesus' resurrection. But today is meant to be a celebration of the actual concrete freedom and transformation Jesus has brought into each of our lives. And that we trust he will continue to bring about in us as we follow him in our days and years ahead. That's what we're meant to be celebrating today. If we are willing to follow Jesus wherever he leads, our minds cannot comprehend what blessings and freedom, or if you'll forgive me for saying, what Easter eggs, it was right there, await. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.